osteoarthritis is the most frequent cause of physical disability among older adults in the world, affecting more than 20 million Americans, with 20% of us destined to be affected in coming decades, and becoming more and more widespread among younger people as well. Osteoarthritis is characterized by loss of cartilage in the joint. We used to think it was just mechanical wear and tear, but is now generally accepted as an active joint disease with a prominent inflammatory component as evidenced by, for example, significantly higher production of inflammatory prostaglandins from tissue samples obtained from the knees of people suffering from the disease. If the loss of cartilage is caused in part by inflammation, might an anti-inflammatory diet help, like it does with rheumatoid arthritis? Using optimal nutrition and exercise as the first-line intervention in the management of chronic osteoarthritis could well constitute the best medical practice. Where's the best science on what optimal nutrition might look like? The China study is a prime example showing the serious health consequences of high consumption of pro-inflammatory foods, meat, dairy, fat, and junk, and low consumption of anti-inflammatory plant foods, whole grains, vegetables, and fruits, and beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils. The unnatural Western diet contributes to low-grade systemic inflammation and oxidative tissue stress and irritation, placing the immune system in an overactive state, a common denominator of conditions such as arthritis. There are phytonutrients in plants that appear to help decrease the degradation of the joint cartilage, the inflammatory activity, the cell death, and oxidative damage. This is based largely on in vitro studies, suggesting protective benefits of soy, and pomegranates, and citrus, and grapes, and green tea, and the curry powder spice turmeric. But my patients are people, not petri dishes. What role might the yellow pigment curcumin and turmeric play in the treatment of osteoarthritis? Well, you know, obesity doesn't just put stress on our joints. Fatty tissue inside our joints, like in the kneecap itself, is a source of pro-inflammatory chemicals that have been shown to increase cartilage degradation. Curcumin may not only help prevent the release of inflammatory chemicals, but slow the formation of the fat pad in the first place. But enough with test tubes. There have been two clinical studies published to date. The latest took 50 patients suffering from moderate to mild knee osteoarthritis and gave them either the best available medical treatment, which included control with anti-inflammatory drugs and painkillers, or the best available treatment along with some proprietary curcumin supplement. They looked at a number of different outcome measures, including the Karnofsky scale, which goes up to 100, which is normal, no complaints, no evidence of disease, down to zero, at which you're dead. The group with the added curcumin did significantly better, and were able to double their walking distance. This is the best medicine I had to offer, so Mother Nature made a counteroffer. The curcumin group was able to significantly decrease their drug use, significantly fewer side effects, less swelling, hospitalizations, and other treatments. But it doesn't have to be some fancy proprietary formula. Here's the other study the efficacy of turmeric extracts in patients with knee osteoarthritis. About 100 sufferers were randomized to ibuprofen or concentrated turmeric extracts for six weeks, and the curcumin group did as good or better than the ibuprofen. Even though ibuprofen is over-the-counter, it can cause ulceration, bleeding, and porphyration of the stomach and intestines. It can eat right through our stomach wall, and in fact that happened to someone in the study. Whereas what are the side effects of curcumin? Potentially protecting against a long list of diseases. According to the World Health Organization, 80% of the Earth's inhabitants rely upon traditional medicines for their primary health care needs, in part due to the high cost of Western pharmaceuticals. Medicines derived from plants have played a pivotal role in the health care of both ancient and modern cultures. One of the prime sources of plant-derived medicines is spices. Turmeric is one such spice, known around the world by different names, my favorite of which is probably Zardchubag. 
Turmeric is the dried powdered rootstocks of the turmeric plant, a member of the ginger family, from which the orange-yellow pigment curcumin can be extracted. The spiced turmeric is what makes curry powder yellow, and curcumin is what makes turmeric yellow. The molecule even looks cool. I always thought it kind of looked like a crab. Anyways, in recent years more than five thousand articles have been published in the medical literature about curcumin. Many sport impressive-looking diagrams suggesting curcumin can benefit a multitude of conditions via dizzying array of mechanisms. Curcumin was first isolated more than a century ago, but out of the thousands of experiments, just a handful in the 20th century were clinical studies involving actual human participants. But since the turn of the century, more than 50 clinical trials have been done, testing curcumin against a variety of human diseases, with 84 more clinical trials on the way. But most of the 5,000 were just in vitro lab studies, which I've resisted covering until they you know, moved more out of the petri dish and into the person. But this study got my attention. Rheumatoid arthritis is a chronic systemic inflammatory disorder that causes progressive destruction of the cartilage and bone of joints. The long-term prognosis of RA is poor, with as much as 80% of patients affected becoming disabled, with a reduction of years in life expectancy. There's lots of drugs one can take, but unfortunately they're often associated with severe side effects, including blood loss and bone loss and bone marrow suppression and toxicity to the liver and eyes. There's got to be a better way. Well, the efficacy of curcumin was first demonstrated over 30 years ago, a double-blind crossover study, curcumin versus phenylbutazone, a powerful anti-inflammatory drug they use in racehorses. Both drugs showed significant improvement in morning stiffness, walking time, joint swelling, with a complete absence of any side effects in the curcumin group, which is more than can be said for phenylbutazone, which was pulled from the market three years later for wiping out some people's immune systems and their lives. Here's the latest. 45 patients diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis were randomized into three groups— curcumin, the standard of care drug, or both. The primary endpoint was a reduction in disease activity, as well as a reduction in joint tenderness and swelling. All three groups got better, but interestingly the curcumin groups showed the highest percentage of improvement, significantly better than those in the drug group. The findings are significant, demonstrating that curcumin alone was not only safe and effective, but surprisingly more effective in alleviating pain compared to the leading drug of choice, all without any apparent adverse side effects. In fact, curcumin appeared protective, given that there were more adverse reactions in the drug group than the combined drug and curcumin group. In contrast to the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, curcumin has no gastrointestinal side effects and may even protect the lining of the stomach. There are anti-inflammatory drugs that may reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease, but stomach, liver, and kidney toxicity precludes their widespread use. So maybe using an anti-inflammatory food, like the spiced turmeric found in curry powder, could offer the benefits without the risks? Before even considering putting it to the test, though, one might ask, well, do populations that eat a lot of turmeric have a lower prevalence of dementia? They may actually have the lowest reported prevalence of dementia in Alzheimer's. OK, so far so good. But maybe because it's such an impoverished area that people just don't live very long. So you need to know more than just prevalence, how many Alzheimer's cases are walking around, but the incidence of the disease, how many new people are coming down with it every year, which reflects the kind of true rate of disease occurrence. In rural Pennsylvania, the incidence rate of Alzheimer's disease among seniors is 19. 19 people in 1,000 over age 65 develop Alzheimer's every year in rural Pennsylvania. In rural India, using the same diagnostic criteria, that same rate is 3, confirming they have among the lowest reported Alzheimer's rates in the world. Although there isn't much to go on, the lower prevalence of Alzheimer's in India is generally attributed to the turmeric consu consumption as part of curry, 
and it's assumed that people who use turmeric regularly have a lower incidence of the disease, but let's not just assume. A thousand people tested, and those who consumed curry, at least occasionally, did do better on simple cognitive tests than those that didn't. Those that ate curry often had only about half the odds of showing cognitive impairment after adjusting for a wide variety of potential confounding factors. This suggests that curry consumption may be associated with better cognitive performance. Of course, it probably matters what's being curried. Are we talking chicken masala or chana masala, with chickpeas instead of chicks? It may be no coincidence that the country with the, among the lowest rates of Alzheimer's has among the lowest rates of meat consumption, with a significant chunk of the population eating meat-free and egg-free diets. We've known uh, for over 20 years now that those who eat meat, red meat or white meat, appear between two to three times more likely to become demented compared to vegetarians. And the longer one eats meat-free, the lower the associated risk of dementia, whether or not you curry favor with your brain.